Today, we're going to be creating a simple JavaScript game. We're not going to be using any frameworks or game engines. This is going to be 100% JavaScript. As you can see, we have a circle on the screen and I'm controlling it using my keyboard. I can move left, right, up, down, and we even detect the edge of the screen and stop our little green blob. This will be a great introduction to some simple game mechanics, such as taking input from the keyboard, detecting the edge of the screen, and last but not least, the game loop, which continuously draws our screen. Using the skills that we learn in this video and my upcoming videos, I plan to create tutorials for both Pac-Man, Tetris, and Snake. If you want to see more of these videos, please subscribe, like, and share. To get started with this project, all we're going to need is an empty folder. If you're comfortable using the command prompt, you can go ahead and create a brand new directory by doing mkdir, which creates a directory and name it green blob or any other name that you want. Then once you're ready and if you have Visual Studio Code, you can go ahead and do code dot once you're inside the directory that you want to be using. This directory I currently have right here just to show you is empty. All I have to do is type go dot, hit enter, and then I'm in my development environment. To get started, all we're going to need is two files. So within Visual Studio Code over here, I'm just going to add two files. One is index.html, and the other file is going to be our JavaScript index.js. Inside of our index.html file, let's go ahead and create the default document template. Now, really simple in Visual Studio Code. Hit exclamation and then tab, and that will create our default document layout. I'm zoomed in a little too far there. There we are. And as you can see, it created our default document layout. You can hit tab, 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 and then we're inside the body. Now, from the layout that we're building previously, we have a title up here. So let's add that real quick green blob. Now, while we're working in this environment, we want to see the screen constantly refreshing. In order to do that, I'm going to be using an extension called Live Server. Now you can install it simply by going over here on the extensions tab, typing in Live Server, installing Live Server, click install. Then if we go back to our application and just right click on index.html and click on open with live server. That will then open up our application over here. And there we are, we have green blob. To make this easier for us to see, I'm going to take this URL over here and put it beside the editor. Now with live server installed, the neat thing is that if I make any changes in my index.html over here, like green blobs and click save, my window will automatically refresh with those changes. So this is going to be great while you're developing. The key piece to the game that we're going to be developing is the canvas. The canvas element will allow us to draw to the screen. And this is what we're going to be doing. So go ahead and create a canvas element. And I'll zoom that in so it's easier to see. And I'll remove the window here on the side just by clicking there. You can hide or show that window. With that hidden, we'll have a little bit more room to work here. And we're going to set our canvas game ID to the game area. We'll give it a height and a width. So our width will be equal to 800 and our height will be equal to 600. Since our canvas is empty, we're not going to see anything on the screen just yet. Next, we'll go ahead and reference our script file over here. So we're going to reference the script file. And now the script file is just beside our document. So we can say index.js. And script tags need to have a closing tag like that. Now to test that this is working, we can open up our developer tools and go to more tools, go to developer tools. Then over, oh, make sure that you have console selected. Then what we're going to do is go into our index.js. So close that, go to index.js. And we're just going to print out a hello over here. Just to double check that we're in a good known state. And there you go. We have hello printing on the screen. So now we know that our HTML and JavaScript file are both working perfectly fine. Quick tip as well, you can move around your console window over here, your developer tools, just by clicking on the three dots and then picking the layout that you want. To make this more readable, I'm just going to move it to the bottom when we need it. So in order to uh, get our game going, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to jump into the index.js over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to get a reference to the game area, that canvas. That's what we're going to be drawing to this entire time. 
So in the console.log over here, we can remove the hello. And then the very first thing we're going to want to do is get a reference to our canvas. So over here, constant canvas is equal to document.getElement by ID. And then remember, the name of our canvas is game area, the identifier. Pass that identifier in over here. In order to draw on the canvas, we need to get something called a context. There are several different contexts, 2D, 3D. And what we're going to want to do for our simple little game, this little blob that we have here, is we just want a 2D context because we're only drawing in two dimensions. So canvas.get context will get us our context. And we just have to tell it the type of context. So we're going for a 2D context. And then one quick, simple thing that we can do for the beginning of our game over here, just to play around and get comfortable with this canvas little typo there as you can see my by having this open i can see any typos that i make and i just made a typo here it says c-a-v-a-s is not defined so c-a-n because i made a typo and then we're good to go benefit of having this open over here is that i can see any errors that i make while i'm developing so let's fill our background with the color black to begin with in order to do that we're going to take our context which we're going to use for our drawing we're going to tell it the color that it's going to draw to the screen with. So we're going to say black. And then we're going to tell it to draw a rectangle to the screen. You're going to give it the X starting position, which starts from the corner of the box that we're going to draw. And then the width, which we're going to get actually from the canvas itself. Because remember, on the HTML element that we set outside here, we actually set a width and a height. So we're going to grab those values from there. So canvas.width and canvas.height. Click Save, and then it fills our canvas over here with those colors. I'll zoom that out so we can see that a little bit better. And there we are. So we have our canvas on the screen, and it's with the color black. And all we've done so far is decide a color and then fill that background. I could make that a different color if I wanted to. And our canvas will change colors. To make this project just a little bit more fun, instead of developing with this white background and this black canvas, let's first just add a tiny bit of styling to give this cool background effect and this different text font that we have over here. So in order to do that, we're going to jump quickly back to our index.html. You can see for game development, you have very minimal HTML, at least for this type of game when you're drawing to a canvas. So first thing that we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and just kind of put our styles in the document. You could put this in a separate file, but this project is so simple, it doesn't really warrant having a separate CSS file. First things first, let's go ahead and style our game area. Now, it may be hard to tell, but I do have a green border around this, and it's a little bit easier to see when it's zoomed in like that. What we're going to do is we're going to add a green border around that box. So the game area is our canvas. And all we're going to do is border, four pixels, solid, green. Then you'll see a green little border around our box here. Next, let's go apply this cool color effect on our background. So no, it's not an image. It's actually something called a gradient. And it just goes from one color to another color. There are a lot of websites that will help you create gradients if you're not really up to doing that yourself. So all we're going to do is add a background like this. And then I'm just going to paste this in because I actually generated this on another website. And I'll link that below in the description. And that's it. You tell your background, you give it a linear gradient. You give it the starting degrees, I believe and then the color that you transition from and the percentage and how that works. A lot of websites will help you generate this for you, give you visual aids to create it for you, and you can just create your own effects. Next, the other thing we have too is our green blobs text over here is align center. So let's go ahead and just align center. Now everything on our page is aligned, our game area plus the text. And one last thing that I want to do is I want to protect against scroll bars appearing as they can affect our keyboard input as we move our blob up and down on the screen. 
So we're just going to set overflow to hidden, which will hide our scroll bars. So just like that, we're going to hide scroll bars. And then our H1, if you've noticed our text over here in our H1 looks like this. It's just the default text that you get. And our text over here is slightly different. So we're just going to use something called Comic Sans. So we're going to go ahead, set that font family to Comic Sans MS. And if I hit save, you'll see that text changes. Figured Comic Sans would be a little bit more appropriate for a game. And that's it. That's all the styling that we have, just a tiny bit. And that's it. That's all the styling that we have for our game. Just a little bit of the game area, a little bit of the body, and a little bit of the H1. Now we can get back to our game development. Back in our index.js, what we're going to do is we're going to create a function that we're going to call draw game. So go ahead and create a function called draw game. Doesn't take any parameters in. And we're going to take that code that we have over here called the, that fills the black background over here that we have. We're going to create another function called clear screen below that. Then we're going to just going to take that little bit of code and put it inside clear screen. Now, once we do that, clear screen's not being executed. So inside of draw game, execute clear screen. And then at the very end, the last thing that we want to do is we call draw game. Draw game is going to, first thing it's going to do is just clear the screen, which creates our background color that we have over here. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned that there's going to be a game loop. Well, this is going to be our game loop over here, the draw game. It's not a game loop yet, but we'll be getting to that shortly. After we've cleared the screen, next we want to draw our little green blob. So let's create a function called draw green blob, and then we're just going to call the function there. Then we'll make a function called draw green blob like that. Inside draw green blob, what we need to do is go ahead and draw our little, little green blob here. Now that green blob is green and it's a circle. So in order to do that, we're going to be using our CTX over here, our context, our 2D context. Originally, when we drew the background over here, clear screen, we set fill style to black. Now we're going to set the fill style equal to green. And then in order to draw a circle, what we need to do is we need to give it a begin path. We need to say that you're going to begin your drawing here. Then what you're going to do is you're going to draw an arc. So this is where we actually draw the circle. Now we need to give this an X position and a Y position. Now those things are going to be changing as we use the keyboard to change the position of our green blob. We also need to give it a radius. So let's also define a variable. Now these variables aren't defined yet. So I'm just doing these down here and then we're going to define them up here. Then we need to give it a starting angle right there and an end angle. Simply for the end angle, all we need to do is math dot pi times two. Then what we're going to do is we're going to define our let x is equal to 100, let y equal to 100. And then we also need a radius. So we're going to say const radius. We'll make it a let just in case we want to change that later. Let radius equal to 50. Then save that. And the last thing that we need to do after we define the arc that we want to create, the circle, is we need to tell the context to fill that circle in. So we call ctx.fill, and then we have a circle on the screen. As you can see, the circle is positioned at x position 100. So x and y start from this very corner over here. x and y are 0 increases as you go right. So this is what 100 position and y increases as you go down. So if we take our y and we make that 400, you'll see that our circle is now further down on the screen. If we increase our x and we make that 550 or nope, that will go if we make it that number, it'll go way off the screen. But if you make it 500, it'll go over this way.
But remember, all positioning X and Y starts from the corner over here. Before we can start taking any keyboard input to start moving our blob around on the screen, we're going to have to make sure that we have a game loop. What does a game loop do? Well, a game loop runs every number of seconds in order to update the screen. The game loop will run 60 times a second in order to redraw our screen over here 60 times a second. Normally, this matches up with your monitor refresh rate. Two different ways of doing this are something with something called a request animation frame where you can ask JavaScript, hey, the next time you're ready to repaint that screen or redraw that screen, execute this particular function and you just give it a function that you pass in. Other way of doing it is by using set interval. With set interval, you give it a function, for example, draw game, and then you give it the interval in which you want this to run. And this is taken in milliseconds. So 1000 milliseconds would mean that I would run draw game every one second. In order to be a proper game and make the screen look really nice while you're doing this, is you want to draw your game in sync with the number of times that your monitor refreshes. You generally don't need to think about this, but most monitors are 60 hertz, 60 hertz which means that your screen be drawn 60 times every one second. Let's take a look at how these two different functions work. So right now in our draw game, if I do a console.log and I say draw and click save, you'll see that draw is only called once. But if I call request animation frame, and with this particular setup that we have right here, recall that we have draw game here at the bottom. So we're doing the initial execution there. Then what we're going to do is request animation frame. And we're going to say call, well, the same function, draw game. And what this will cause is a loop. And you can see that this number over here in my console is increasing continuously. So the screen is being redrawn. And this will be great because once we're taking keyboard input, our character will move across the screen and be redrawn all the time. So the way this works, just to recap, is draw game is called at the end. Then when we're executing draw game, we go ahead and say, queue it up, say request animation frame. As soon as you're ready, go ahead and recall draw game. So this ends, ends up going in a continuous loop. And that's why we see draw being called over and over and over. The alternative way to doing this is using set interval. So to use set interval, we don't need to call draw game at the end over here like this. What we need to do instead, I'm going to remove request animation frame. And instead of calling draw game, all we have to do is say set interval and then say which function we're going to use. We're going to use draw game. We're going to call it every 1000 seconds. And to match my monitor's refresh rate, which is 60 hertz, I'm going to divide by 60. So it gets called 60 times a second. Click save. And you can see we get the same result. It just keeps drawing the screen over and over. And you'll see how useful this is once we start taking keyboard input. Before we continue, let's actually use request animation frame. So I'm going to put request animation frame back in. I'll remove these comments that we're not using. Then at the bottom of the screen, I'll delete line 28 and put back line 27. So just to recap for request animation frame, we execute draw game at the very end of our, of our file over here. And then we call request animation frame over here, which will queue up to draw the next screen when it's ready. At the same time, we'll also remove that console.log because we can see that it's working. Now let's get our character moving on the screen. The first direction that we're going to get our character to move is down. So we're going to set down pressed equal to false. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be listening to the keyboard. So if you're pushing down on the down key, we're going to say down pressed is equal to true. Once you let go of that key and the key goes up, we're going to say it's equal to false. The way we're going to achieve this is using two events, key up and key down. For the key down event, we're going to set it up as follows. Here in the bottom of our file over here, we're just going to use document dot body dot add event listener and the event listener that we're going to add is key down all lowercase like that 
and then we need to give it a function to execute. We're also going to be listening to the document dot body dot add event listener and we're going to listen to key up and also give that a function called key up. We haven't created the key down and key up function so we get this error over here. Then we'll define those two functions key down as follows which will take in an event. And we'll define also the key up, which also takes in an event. Let's implement that key down event. Inside the key down event over here, what we're going to do is we're going to detect if the current key is the down key. So if the event dot key code is equal to or equal equal to 40 then down pressed is going to be equal to true okay so what is an event and what's a key code the event over here is what gets passed into the key down event that event will contain information about the key that it's responding to the key that's responding to when i push down will have a code now, every single key on your keyboard has a code, and the down will have key code 40. Now, how did I know that? Well, one is I could use console.log in order to print that on the screen, but I also just Googled it. It's easy enough to Google and check what the key codes are for all the keys. For example, over here, I've Googled JavaScript key code arrow keys. And as you can see, I can find that the down key over here is number 40. The other keys that we're going to be using are also here too as well for left, up, and right. Now that we have this key code over here, when you push it down on the down key, we're going to say down pressed is equal to true. That means that we need to change our Y position. If it's 100, we're going to want our character to move down the screen. We can increment by 1, we can increment by 10, we can increment by different numbers. The way that we're going to do that is before we draw our green blob is we're going to make a function called inputs and inputs will respond to the different key presses. So let's go ahead and define inputs. Then over here, we're going to create a function called inputs and inside inputs, what we're going to do is we're going to say if down pressed is equal to true, then we're going to say y is equal to y plus 10. So now when I push down on my keyboard, our character moves down. Now I pushed that key once and the character continued to move down the screen. The reason for that is down pressed was always true. Remember, we registered key down and we said down pressed equals true. Well, we didn't do the opposite of that, which is we need to detect when the key is let go of. In order to do that, all we have to do is copy and paste what we have inside our key down events, put that inside our key up, then set down pressed to false. Save that, go back to our game and push down. Now our character moves a little bit at a time. Now that we can move our character in the down direction, Let's get the rest of those directions done as well. So we're going to add a few more events over here. We're going to say let up pressed equal to false. Then we'll do let left pressed equal to false. And then let right pressed equal to false. Then what we're going to do is implement our inputs over here. And now I don't want to have to put 10 all the time because I might want to change that number in the future. So we're going to define another variable called speed. And I'll make that equal to 10 for now. And then over here, I'll say let y equal to y plus speed so that we can change the speed of our character movement if we wanted to. You see, if I make this one and save it and now click down, you can see I move just a tiny bit at a time. If I make this 20, it moves a lot quicker on the screen. So we're going to keep that at 10 because it seems to be a good speed. So we'll go ahead over here and I'm going to try and keep these all in the same order. So we're going up, down, left, right. So over here, I'm going to do our up now. 
do our up, what we're going to want to do is another up if statement. And we're going to say if up crest, what we're going to do, because our y, so for down, we're increasing the y. For up, we want to decrease the y. So let's say y is equal to y minus speed. Now, you can also write this as y minus equals speed. And that will do exactly the same thing as this line up here. But we'll stick with this one for now. So there you go. Now, this still isn't going to work just yet. So I'm going to implement the right and the left. Let's go left, crest. Now for left, we're going x. So that means when we go this way on the screen, you know, going left, we're going to go negative. So x, now the x position is going to be x minus speed. And save that. Then if right is pressed, well, right is going to be x, which is positive going this way. So x is equal to x plus speed. With all of our inputs over here handled up, down, left, right, pressed, now we just need to implement the keyboard events over here. So we've done the down, and now we're going to go with the same order we did before. So we're going to have up. So if the event.keycode is going to be equal to the up key code, which is 38, then what we're going to do is we're going to say that up is being pressed. And we're going to set that to true. Then just to speed things up, I'm going to copy the down over here. And I'm just going to put left or there. And then if the left key code, which is equal to 37, remember these you can just Google. So left pressed is equal to true. And then just take that again and copy it and put right. And then if right is pressed, we'll set that to true. And the right pressed key code is equal to 39. Here you go. So we, the only thing we haven't implemented is the up. And this is pretty simple. I am going to just copy and paste this whole thing that's inside key down and do the opposite. It's a little bit of an anti pattern here because these are very similar except for which value gets changed. But that could be fixed in a refactoring. Now it's really cool right here. If you're in Visual Studio Code and you highlight the word true and you hit Control D on Windows or Command D, as you can see, I can highlight. Every time I click it, it highlights the next row. So now this one's going to be highlighted. And now I have four different cursors. That entire thing is highlighted. I can just type false and it types false in every single one of those. So now that we've set up our variables at the top for the pressed, we've implemented the inputs to change the various speeds or the various positions for y and x and then we've also handled the keyboard events now when i go back to our project over here i can go down up left and right and because we implemented the speed being the same for all the positions i can also change that speed if i wanted to and make it faster if i wanted to and then I can move even faster on the screen. And as you can see, I even can move in a diagonal position because it's detecting when left and right are pushed together and our circle will move in a diagonal. Let's put that back to 10 as it's more manageable. And if we come back over here, you can see that diagonal as I can move in. The last thing that we need to do is check the boundary. So our little green blob over here can go right off the screen and we don't want our green blob wandering away. So let's do a boundary check. To do a boundary check, we're going to check, you know, if you're hitting the top of the screen and going out and the same for the left, right and down. So in order to do that, right after we've updated our inputs, we're going to check that the, all those inputs are valid. So over here, we'll create a function called boundary check. So go ahead and create your boundary check. And then inside the boundary check, let's check that up boundary first. So the way we're going to do that is we know the radius of our circle. And we're going to say if y is less than the radius of our circle, reset the y position equal to the radius. Now, if I try and move my circle, he can't, no matter how much speed he gains, he can never go beyond 
the top position over here. Can exit the top part of the screen. Now, let's just say that I played around with these numbers and I did minus 10 here and minus 10 here. Uh, minus 10, you'll see that our circle will, uh, well, let's let's do a higher number there. Let's do 40 and 40. So now you can see my circle gets cut off. In order to prevent my circle from being cut off, I do y is less than the radius and then set it back to that number. So even if behind the scenes, my circle disappears behind there, we just reset them to this position over here. Now let's check the down position going to put a comment over here that that's up and then we'll do the down right there and we're going to say if the y is greater than our canvas dot height so let's give that a try let's see what happens what this effect is if we do it then we'll say y is equal to canvas dot height if i exceed the canvas height let's try that you can see half our circle goes away well in order to fix that, we know that radius is half the circle. So we'll do radius, we'll do height minus radius, and height minus radius over here to reset you back, so that if that happens, then you can't go through the bottom. To block our little green blob from going over the left side, we're going to do the x position, because now we're on the x, left and right. We'll do x is less than radius, which is just like our up over there, but on the x plane. Then we'll say x is equal to radius. Right now, I can go through, but click save. Now I can't go through. Can't go to the top, can't go to the sides. Now what about our right side? Well, right side is going to be kind of like the down. So we'll put a comment there for left. And then for the right over there, we'll say if the x is greater than canvas.width, minus the radius, then we can say x is equal to, and we can just copy and paste that there. Now, when our little green blob moves, can't go beyond that area. And now we've implemented exactly the same game that we had at the beginning of this tutorial. Same colors, same CSS, and same functionality over here, where I can move my circle around, and I can't escape the various, this little box that our green blob is contained within. The cool thing with a little game like this that we've made is that we have all these variables now that we can play with. We can add more key presses and do different things. We can increase the size of our circle if we wanted to. Because we use these variables and not hard-coded numbers, we could make our circle a lot bigger. But also, once our circle is a lot bigger, we still can't exit the screen because we use the radius in our calculations in the boundary check. So no matter how small or how big we make this circle, it can never escape. Now that's a really tiny circle there, but it can't escape outside of our boundary. So go ahead, once you've done this tutorial, it's fun to play with these numbers and see what you can do. You can definitely do some really cool things. One just feels incredibly slow. Ten feels more smooth with the movement of our little green blob. As I mentioned, you can do some pretty cool things with these variables and get really creative. So let's try one creative thing here. In the draw green blob, what we're going to do is change the color depending on the direction that you're going. So if you are going up, let's change that color. So the default style will be green. We'll put that at the top. And then if up is pressed, what we're going to do is change that color. There we go. Change that color. So I'm just going to copy that style. And we'll change that to red. And then we'll just copy this over here and we'll say if down is pressed, what we'll do is we'll change that color to blue. And then if left is pressed, we'll make the color yellow. And then for right, make sure we got our spacing good here. I'm just going to put them all together like that. And then the last one that we need to do is right. 
we have red, blue, yellow, and we'll do purple. So let's go ahead and try that out. As you can see, the blob is still green. So this code over here is being executed while it stays still and no buttons are being pushed. But once I move and I move right, it's purple. If I move left, it's yellow. If I move up, it's red, which looks really, really cool on the screen as we move our character around. So there's just a little bit of creativity that you can add to your game and you can change it around just by playing around with the variables and changing how it behaves. You can get these really cool effects. I challenge you to try and create something creative using some of the game mechanics that you've learned here. In addition to React and JavaScript, I plan to make more videos about creating games in JavaScript. I look forward to creating tutorials on Pac-Man, Tetris, Snake, and other smaller videos about various gaming mechanics. If you'd like to see more of these videos, please subscribe, like, and share.